Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we're going to be tackling a tough topic, maybe one that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but we're going to talk about it, and you get the benefit of listening. Today, we're talking about EB-5 denials, counselor denials, and removal proceedings. And with that, I will hand you off to your host, Moda Shaw. <laughs> hey, Moda. How are you, Mark? Doing well. Uh, we have Rebecca as well on this podcast. Hi, Mark. Good to hear from you again. Hey, Rebecca. Glad to have you on again. So we've got some tough topics uh, ahead of us. Give us some background. Yeah, we have actually. Um, A lot of people, a lot of time, whenever we talk about EB-5, we all love to talk about the good stuff, projects and the green card and the job creation. And as I said, all the good stuff. But we feel that we should be discussing um, what goes wrong within um, the EB-5 context. Today, what we are talking about mostly is is denials. But if you may recall, I did discuss escrow issues uh, when we had the episode with Bob Slosky. We discussed on that episode what would happen uh, when the money actually got released to the project or if the money had been already released to the project and the case was denied. Right. And that was concerning a lot with the investment risk as well as uh, the project risk and the project uh, or the risk of the funds either being released to the project or not and some of the consequences to the overall project development. But as I understand it, today we're going to be talking about the actual immigration implications of these EB-5 denials and these counselor denials and what we can expect with these removal proceedings. Right. But we also wanted to touch on the project implications also because it does come up um, all the time. And we do face issues on a daily basis where projects getting denied. See, a denial can happen at three stages. They can happen at filing the I-526. It could be denied at the consular processing stage, or it could be denied at the I-829 stage. Great. Well, it sounds like the first thing to do is is let's focus on the denial at the I-526 stage, the the initial petition. Right. Can you describe uh, really what that process is and what's the risk of denial and what could result in a denial? Yes, certainly. Um, Well, the most important thing for developers to know is that if there is a denial at 526 stage, that's when it really affects the developer. Denials at later stages, quite frankly, don't because they've already have access to capital and they've already begun and hopefully completed their project. But at the I-526 stage, almost every developer has a guarantee that the investor will have a return of his initial capital should the 526 be denied. So, yes, we are going to look at this carefully, and and this is perhaps the most common denial. What kinds of things could trigger a denial at the 526 stage? Well, there are two types of denials. There could be a, a denial for the actual project. Or they could be um, a denial. And we, we actually split up that into two because a reason for a project denial and a reason for an entrepreneur project denial are, are usually different. And so separating direct from a regional center case or direct entrepreneur in a regional center case. Um, and then there's the other reasons for a denial at this stage are that the source of funds are being denied. And that one is is also very common. And Rebecca is very familiar with, with dealing troubleshooting on areas here as we see a problem cases all the time. As experienced EB-5 attorneys, we actually don't see too many denials on our end, but there can be issues that we can um, help troubleshoot with, um, and we're more than happy to work with other attorneys as well. Yeah, what often happens, Mark, is that uh, another project or um, an attorney will get a denial and they'll send us the denial and we get uh, we inv- get involved at the later stage or sometimes at the RFE stage to see if we can save the project. But getting back to uh, the reasons, your question, the most common reasons for the denials, if I start with the RC first, a regional center can be denied on different areas. It could be denied because the structure is incorrect. It could be denied because the wording within the documentation is not allowed. Um, you could have prohibited clauses like a redemption agreement. 
It could also be denied, and this is what we find the most common, that it just lacks credibility. Mm -hmm. um, a project can lack credibility on several fronts. Um, it can lack credibility with relation to finances. It can lack credibility with relation to its overall goals. And most importantly, it can lack credibility as to the job creation. But people don't often understand that a project can actually be denied. It's, it is very important to um, make sure that the documentation is absolutely correct. It's, it, there isn't such a thing as a complete template because we have seen many cases where somebody's used a template and not understood a template or put a little scenario in which hasn't been accepted. I'll give you an example of a regional center project which is denied for reasons that really nobody really thought about as much. There was a regional center project which was denied, and this went as far as the AAO. Here, this project was about the renovation of a Radisson hotel. Radisson. Yeah, it was a Radisson hotel, and it wasn't the construction of a Radisson, it was the renovation. Each investor was promised an apartment within this hotel and uh, a, a particular room at the end. And the USCIS denied this petition because they said that it was uh, promising the investor something. They were getting something back. And they did appeal. And it went to the AAO. And when they appealed, they did say mm -hmm. uh, the investors did try to say that, look, the money was going into construction. It was still at risk. But the AAO came down in favor of USCIS on the grounds that there was an existing room. So even if the renovations hadn't been completed, each investor had at least a room. They had something back. Their money really wasn't totally at risk. There was a promise there. So that's an, an example of a way a project can be denied. But most usually we see project denials on silly technicalities, technicalities relating to escrow, technicalities relating to to redemption agreements or matter of whole documents and more recently documents relating to accountings and the credibility of the financial analysis would you agree Rebecca yes to chip in here um, and expand on what Mona was explaining what's also important is verification and so as Mona was saying that the financials are very important but it's also important to verify who came up with these financials you can't just say that, you know, if you have no one, someone who came up with these without any experience, it's not going to go with USCIS. Right. So when we get a project developer who comes up with a pro forma, um, we always ask where where he gets his figures from. You can't pluck the figures from just thin air, basically. And mm -hmm. then uh, he would, the project developer would say, OK, well, I've based it on six other hotels that I've built before or five other projects that I already have or another project similar to this. Uh, but if it's the first time a, a developer is doing something and he has no idea where the project uh, the costs are coming from, USCS mm -hmm. are going to question mm -hmm. it. And they may do more than just question it. Yeah. And it's also important to note where Mona was discussing redemption clauses. Um, you also have to realize this is it's not only an at-risk program, but it's also uh, ha you have a chance to gain. So you have to be sure that your investors are also have the opportunity to make money, um, not just lose. Right. And often um, it, you might have a project, and again, we've seen this, where you have somebody who thinks they're very smart so, and they, they, they draft the documents out in such a way that there really is no chance to gain. Mm -hmm. And USCS have seen quite through right through that uh, and they've denied it. Mm -hmm. It's not an investment if there is no reasonable expectation for a return. Uh, right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank goodness we have Omar, our securities and corporate attorney. He spots all that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So basically, the project documents are often denied for different reasons than an entrepreneur. A direct project could be denied for the same reasons as a project, uh, as an RC denial, in the sense there could be a promise there, a redemption agreement or, or lack of credibility. But most of the time we see denials from direct pooled cases based on corporate structure. Mm -hmm. Denials on entrepreneur cases, though, those are totally different. Entrepreneur cases are pretty difficult to put together because there is quite a high denial rate, mm -hmm. surprisingly. So what are the reasons that an entrepreneur project are different? At the 526 stage, a lot of entrepreneur cases really, they don't specify well enough issues relating to credibility and issues relating to job creation. And I think perhaps job creation is, is one of the biggest areas where we see denials at entrepreneur cases. Yeah, you have to be sure here um, with the direct project that these are going to be direct jobs that will be created. Whereas with the regional center, 
you have indirect and induced jobs. So you have to be sure that you have enough jobs and that the project itself can create those jobs and that you're not just making up or adding two jobs just because you need it for the EB-5 purpose. Right. And also interesting that most, a lot of in entrepreneur cases are people investing in an existing business and they use documents like promissory notes and other financial notes and financial instruments rather. These have to be really carefully drafted. The corporate structure of these has to be carefully looked at. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of denials which can come from these areas. Yeah, in addition to uh, with direct entrepreneur cases, um, a lot of clients come to us and say, oh, okay, so the fees to my 85 attorney will go my million or 500,000 or whatever they're investing in can be used for EB-5 purposes. That's both for regional center and direct projects, but we see that a lot more with the direct projects because individual clients themselves do not realize that they're spending for EB-5 purposes. in well, Within their money, yes, yeah. that's right. You aren't able to take out impermissible spending from, from the EB-5 funds. <laughs> Well, that makes sense, right? You have to use the money in such a way that it's going to help and create those jobs, not in ways or avenues that doesn't really create jobs, because really, it looks like you're, you're, you're shaking a silly monkey, right. right? You're saying, hey, I'm going to use this money to create jobs, but you use the money to do something or perform an action that doesn't create jobs that USCIS has already identified. No, you can't use funds for that. So it sounds like they, they right. keep well, we have We do have a podcast coming on, on use of funds, Mark, um, and especially... One of the big questions which has been asked an awful lot lately is, do I have to put all of my money in at front or right. can I put money in piecemeal? So we decided to have a complete podcast discussing that. So I don't really want to go into that at this stage. This particular podcast was more for denials, but we did want to mention one thing. You don't uh, get a straight out denial usually. Mm -hmm. There is a, a procedure and an opportunity to correct yeah, so expanding on that, um, once USCIS see an issue on your case, they can send what's sort of called a request for evidence. That's an RFE, as most people will know it as. Or they can send a notice of intention to deny, which is annoyed. Uh, usually you will get the RFE first, but if there's something blatant and USCIS believes this is something that cannot be corrected, they will send annoyed um, before sending the, the denial. What is very important is the time difference. Mm -hmm. With an RFE, you are given around about three months to respond. Days, yeah, exactly. yeah. But mm -hmm. for annoyed, it's strict 30 days. Yeah. That can be really tough, especially when you're dealing with overseas um, investors. Exactly. Right. And the reasons for denial could be simple. And some of them could be pretty complex and span out into multiple documents. And it, it sounds like to correct that within 30 days would certainly be tough. Right, right, right. Most of what we have discussed um, relates to project denials, but a lot of the denials which come in are denials relating to SOFs, uh, source of funds. Yeah, so as we explained earlier, if you do have an experienced attorney such as us, uh, we can spot those issues from the beginning. Uh, we try not to file any cases that we think will have an RFE or any uh, denial issues. If there are by chance, for instance, we have some clients who do not want to give us documents. Documentation is very important. USCIS wants to see um, evidence of your source of funds. For example, if you're going to use proceeds from a sale of property, they also want to see the seed money. So you have to prove that as well. In addition to your path of funds. So you have to provide bank statements to show if your funds have been transferred from one bank statement to the other. Right. And uh, we often find that some countries that we deal with, such as the United Kingdom, there is a reluctance. It's like, OK, you know, it's obvious that this is what it is. And there is a reluctance to give us some documents. And uh, when we end up with an RFE, <laughs> mm -hmm. we say, well, look, we did tell you. Uh, USCIS don't differentiate from country to country. That's what we have definitely seen. They do want the same documentation and they will deny somebody from the United Kingdom in the same way they'll deny somebody from China. Right. But it sounds like, as Rebecca said, you try not to you know, submit a petition that you know or have a reasonable suspicion that it's going to be denied. But it, it does sound like you follow your client's wishes. And after you let them know, look, I, I need this document. You're not going to provide it to me. I can file it anyway, but just expect an RFE or at worst annoyed. Is that correct? Right. Most of the time we can we can judge whether or not mm -hmm. USCS are going to accept a document. Um, 
the uh, burden of proof is on the investor and it's a balance of probabilities. What that really means, it's more likely than not that what the investor is saying is true. And it's not often that USCS will go behind a document and look for something which is false, which is not obviously false. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark, you can be denied at the 526 stage or an investor can be denied at the consulate stage. Now, if an investor is denied at the consulate stage, they don't get their green card. They don't come into the United States. But I would say 99% of the time, the project has access to uh, their capital. So whether or not an investor gets his capital back being denied at this stage is, it matters on a case to case basis. Wow, that sounds horrible. Yeah, it is. It is actually. And, and an investor can be denied at the consulate stage and have to wait five years for his money to come back. But the reasons behind that are because most of the time at the consulate stage, if there is a denial, it's the investor's fault. Um, most of the times at the 526 stage, if there's, for example, a project denial, it's not the investor's fault. So it sounds like at the consular stage, it's really up to the investor. So what can the EB-5 investor do or be on the lookout that would put their own immigration process and their own money really at risk? Well, it's very important to speak to an independent attorney. I'm uh, quite against in-house attorneys because I feel that often in-house attorneys do not look beyond the 526 and they do not look to see whether or not somebody really is going to be denied at the consular stage because they really don't care. I uh, agree with Melinda because at that point you have to realize that an I-526 approval is great, but it does not mean you get that visa to enter the United States. That's where you have to make sure your consular processing is done. You have an attorney who can guide you through that. Right. And obviously, from the very outset, your attorney should be asking you questions relating to whether you're admissible or likely to be inadmissible and therefore likely to get a denial at the consulate stage. Now, when we talk about being inadmissible, that has to do with the investor's ability to enter meaning either they've committed a crime and they are an inadmissible or they've been in the United States previously and they've overstayed and they're an inadmissible or there may be some other reason such as they're wanted for tax fraud or there's a known uh, offense out which may not be offense an offense in the United States but it's an mm -hmm. offense in their own country they can be denied at that time yeah. as well and, and if you have if you pose any threat to the US national security that is the grounds for denial and also uh, certain health issues. Uh, so our clients have to be sure they go ahead and get that medical report done. So that way, if there are any issues that can be taken care of before they enter the U.S. Right. If you have TB or if you have AIDS, you can be denied. You can get a waiver to it nowadays, but it is a denial. And then if, for example, you, you're going to be named on an Interpol report as well, that's mm -hmm. enough to get you denied. Mm -hmm. Or at least, you know, your, your, your name flagged uh, and you're waiting for an awful long time. I was going to chip in, whereas we've seen, you know, a lot of this has to do with the investor himself, and they have to be sure that they are truthful through their attorneys, especially when it comes to, you know, criminal overstays. You can get barred for staying in the U.S. Um, on a separate visa prior through your 10 years. But another issue uh, that has been seen is the issue with adoption. We've seen that some countries don't have adoption. They have what's called guardianship. And if you don't have a full right adoption, you can be denied Actually, the investor will not be denied. The investor will get the visa to enter the U.S. The child, unfortunately, will be denied. Right. That's an unfortunate situation mm -hmm. which has happened. And countries typically where um, you will not get an adoption certificate are countries which are mostly Muslim countries like mm -hmm. Bangladesh, like Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And there are a few others. They issue a guardianship, as, as Becky just mentioned. They issue, a, um, uh, is it a notice of guardianship or is it a decree? It's a decree. But the, that's not recognized by the U.S. consulate as having uh, custody of the child. So for that person, they can't, even if they get an approved 526, they themselves will be approved, but they won't be able to bring their child into the United States. And that has happened before. and It's quite horrid. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through another process because then you'd have to make sure either you're a U.S. citizen uh, or that you've been here as an LPR. And there's so many different issues with adoption. So then you have to go through another stage to get that child in. At the consulate stage, the consulate isn't supposed to revisit what has been filed with USCIS. 
However, mm-hmm. they will require a knowledge of the project and knowledge of how the source of funds was obtained. So this is where USCIS or, or the officers at the consulate want to be sure that the investor coming in is nothing fraudulent. So they want to make sure that this is your petition, you've invested, um, and you're coming in because of that investment. Fraud can ban you from the U.S. for life. So it's very important that you know the project, you know what you're going into, and you know your own source of funds. Okay, so obviously there's a, a number of ways that it could be denied at the counselor stage. You've gone through a, quite a number of them, and it sounds like it's a lot of issues to do with the investor, both within their control and some may be outside of their control, but at least they could be proactive, such as you know getting the medical inspections and any other documents that they need to prove that they are not a risk to the U.S. Uh, in early. So let's now explore this third stage, and I guess that's the denial at the 829 stage when you remove the conditions of the green card? Yes, that's the one which everybody fears the most. Yeah. Because at that stage, often you're here for a few years and you're settled – um, and you've been waiting. And if you get denied at the I-29 stage, it's pretty tough. Denials at the I-29 stage are usually, uh, they fall into three categories. You have to show for an I-29 to be approved that the investment has been sustained, that the jobs have been created, and that there isn't any material change, as well as the fact that the investor themselves remains admissible, meaning that during the period that they've been in the United States, they haven't had a criminal conviction or done something else that would be inadmissible, like have three or four wives or (laughs) try and attack the president or something. (laughs) But with sustaining the investment, that's not really material so much with regional center cases as it is with entrepreneur cases. In an entrepreneur case, you really have to show that the money has remained in the project throughout and you haven't taken the money out after a few months. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal for entrepreneur cases. And that's a lot of times an entrepreneur case may fall down because the money cannot be shown to be sustained. Or what might happen, this is an AO decision also, an investor took his money out or took a partial amount out, but showed that there were profits to the business and therefore the money was the amount of money he initially contemplated was still there. But because the initial investment was taken out, even though there were profits of a business, that wasn't counted. So again, you have to be very careful uh, for entrepreneur cases. I would say job creation is the number one issue Mm -hmm. relating to IA29 denials. With a direct or an, a direct pool or an entrepreneur case, the job creation is all direct. So you have to show W-2s, you have to show I-9s, maybe E-Verify um, uh, to show that there was an actual job. But that's not everything. Mm-hmm. You have to make sure that that person is not disqualified, that that person is an appropriate person for the job. So that means a U.S. citizen, a legal permanent resident, or anyone who's capable of working in the U.S. with what's called an employment authorization document. Right. In the case of a regional center, which is revenue-based, uh, which is the, where the economic report sorry, is, is based on revenue, what has to be shown here is that the right amount of money has been spent and all the jobs were created. If, for example, you are discussing a hotel, if we're discussing a hotel and the hotel hasn't been built and it's only been partially built, how much money has actually been spent? Have all the jobs been created? Are we able to show that there is a strong likelihood that all the jobs will be created within a reasonable amount of time? These are all issues which are looked at in the job creation part. The other thing about the job creation area is that they that USCS will again look at the credibility of of, of not only the finances, of what the economist uses to come up with his figure. And if for, for if any reason they decide that there are certain elements which were counted earlier, which should not be counted, certain factors within the revenue structure which shouldn't be there and the uh, economists have counted it, then they will remove that. For example, land. You mm-hmm. can't count land. You can't ca- count certain amount of um, some legal expenses. So if an economist has counted those, then those will be deducted and the amount of jobs will be reduced. 
there's obviously keeping the money in the investment, uh, particularly for these entrepreneur visas, even if their cash flows and profitability as such, they have to keep that money in there at risk, at least um, through the the, the 829 stage, uh, just to show that you know their money is at risk. Uh, you said the number one reason, job creation, make sure that they're verified through these, uh, you know, the I-9 audits and E-Verify, make sure that they're legitimate workers that have these legitimate jobs, as well as regional centers or bigger projects. You know, have they spent money or have they developed their project up to a certain point that the economists assumed that they would be at for that indirect or induced jobs? Because if it's not, then, well, maybe you didn't create those jobs and well, maybe that project no longer qualifies for, for that investor. And as well, as you said, there's could be some other, you know, material things that happen to the investor themselves that would otherwise make them uh, inadmissible. So those or, are or a material change within the project. We have a, a podcast discussing material change coming uh, yes soon. We do. So. <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. So I'm not going into material change as such, but we, we discuss quite a lot in that. And it's a kind of a complex topic. So we thought we would have a whole a podcast for that. And, and we'll so dive we'll in deep then. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this. What would happen if the investor dies or gets a divorce? If the investor dies, Mark, the dependents do carry on and they get their visas. They are able to. It depends, again, which stage they die at. But most of the times um, they they do get their visas. Yeah, same with a divorce. If the clients come in and, they, you know, they got their visas from the I-526 stage um, and then let's say they're ready to file their I-829 and at that point they're divorced, you should... Divorcee from the petitioner should be able to get their um, permanent green card as well. Right. We often get asked is that if somebody gets divorced and remarried, what happens? Who gets the green card? Well, the original wife gets the green card. And the one who is the investor now remarries will have to go through the whole I-130 process. Mm -hmm. That's good to keep in mind. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you receive a denial? Okay, well, if you receive a denial, again, it depends what stage you're at. But let's say you receive a denial at the 526 or the 829 stage, which are both in the United States. Then you have different options. One option is to go back to USCIS. You might ask for a motion to reconsider or a motion uh, to reopen. Mm -hmm. There are two different reasons. Uh, There are two different types of motions. One motion is if you believe that USCIS has overlooked a material point, And the other motion is if there was something material that uh, would have changed the decision but was not presented. If both of these motions get denied, um, you don't hear anything more, then your next option um, is to go to an appeal stage. And at this, it's an administrative appeal, so you would go to the AAO, Administrative Appeals Office. But most of the times, although some cases might go to an AAO, Maybe if there is a, um, a child age out involved or, or something of that nature. But most of the times, um, what we find is that an investor will just refile the case. There isn't really any penalty for refiling. However, at the consular processing stage, if you're denied, it's very hard to get that overturned. At that point, it's the discretion of the officer. And if you receive a denial, what you can do is maybe ask for an advisory opinion Um, Yeah, there's no appeal, right? Exactly. And there's certainly no appeal to the United States. It's all the discretion of the officer. Yes. But as we said, that's very difficult to overturn. So just be sure that you're very prepared before going into uh, the consular processing stage. The advisory opinion is is often a good way to go because a consul officer has to specifically state his reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I would say most of the time they do have uh, a good enough reason. (laughs) Sometimes the officers, before denying, they'll actually send it back to USCIS for an opinion. Um, we've seen that, and uh, we've seen cases where they've gone back and being held just to be sure that um, there's nothing fraudulent going on with the case. So if, instead of outright denying it at the consular processing, they'll send it back, and hopefully USCIS will give an, a good outcome. Okay. So let's say that you're here in the United States and well, you receive a denial. Does that put you in some type of removal proceedings? And if so, what happens? Yes. Well, at this point, if you're in the United States and you receive a denial at the 829 stage, and I have to add in here, Mark, that USCS give the, uh, they afford the investor every opportunity mm-hmm. to be able to respond to their issues. You even get uh, an interview, unless you really don't want an interview. You get a chance to take your economist and your attorney and everybody you want along 
to the interview. But if at this stage you are still denied, you do have a little bit of a gap whereby you can actually file a second petition because there is a gap between all of this happening and the final, final mm -hmm. denial. And most people do file a backup petition as well. If you didn't find any backup petition and if you're absolutely adamant that you're correct and if you get denied, then what happens? You can't actually file an appeal. Here, what happens is that you get automatically uh, sent over to a, an immigration judge and you would get put into removal proceedings. Your actual status as a conditional resident gets terminated and you're really out of status in that respect. You shouldn't certainly shouldn't travel. And then now you're in front of an immigration judge and the immigration judge will look at your case de novo, which means they will look at your case from the beginning again. Mm -hmm. Okay. At that point, just to elaborate on that, the burden of proof is on the government. So they have to show why is it that your case is being denied. Right. But there are two um, exceptions to unlawful presence if uh, you do happen to fall out of status at any stage, really, not just at the 829 stage if you're denied, even perhaps before then, maybe before you even file, after you file the 526 and between that and adjustment, if you are in the United States. And those two exceptions are people who are asylees and battered women. They both can file exceptions to unlawful presence. Okay. One of the most important questions which does come up uh, for people in removal proceedings, Mark, and we get this from attorneys all the time, is if their client is out of status and or in removal proceedings, can they file for EB-5? Well, usually no, because they must be in status to be able to apply for EB-5 if they're going to adjust. There is a one little exception, and that is if you are under 245I. If you are under the 245I exception, you can adjust your status and you can, you're okay if you, you are out of status in the United States. But the, the issue of your lawful funds is, is something that you have to look at. Yes. Okay. Obviously, this is a hard topic to talk about, right? Because we're not talking about ooh, great opportunities, but we're talking about real risk here. And that's, you know, denials at the initial petition, there's denials at the consular stage. And then, you know, about two years later, or so there's another denial when you try to remove the, the conditions from that green card. And it sounds like there's a number of reasons that the EB-5 could get denied at those various stages. And it also sounds like there's a number of, of ways to, well, uh, be proactive about it, as well as, you know, if there is a denial or some type of notice of denial or request for evidence, or, or even, you know, uh, court proceedings where you're in front of a federal immigration judge, you know, there's options there, as long as uh, you're working with a good team, and continue to, to push and, and work with it. I think that was the key point in working with a good team from the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Well, Mona, Rebecca, thank you so much for, well, really talking about this topic that eh, no one wants to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult discussion, but I'm so glad we had it. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today on EB5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw and Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M-S-H-A-H law.com. Or call the office at 212-233-7473. Don't worry about trying to write all this down as it's already embedded in your podcast player of choice. The contact information and other valuable resources can be found there. Although this concludes our discussion of denials and the various stages of which denials could occur and how they could occur, I have a ray of hope for you. In the next show, we're going to be talking about the EB-5 offering documents and common red flags. Make sure you don't miss it by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB-5 Investment Voice.